Another reverse card. The conviction was again vacated. Reverse the reverse. You guys dizzy yet? Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew, ew, ew, trime. Crew Trime. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. <laughs> and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and turn on all of the notifications so that you never miss one of my terrible stories. Before we get started in the story, I wanted to address one little nugget that I noticed in the comments of last week's video. Thank you for the love on last week's video, <laughs> by the way. You will notice that I bleeped out or, you know, quacked out the, uh, the word murder <laughs> in the first few minutes of the video. It's because the YouTube bots, you know, don't like that word. They don't like a lot of words. It's upsetting for advertisers apparently and that case in that story the gypsy rose blanchard case is so hot in the news the bots are like huh hmm they're, they're listening extra hard i don't typically have issues with that sort of thing normally and I, i'm not shy to use those words you guys know you know unless i'm trying to be silly or some other good reason like not being demonetized <laughs> that's all but thanks for asking. So let's get to today's terrible story, shall we? This is the story of Martha Moxley. Okay, I haven't given this disclaimer in a few videos, but yeah, I'm putting on makeup, but I don't feature the makeup as I'm putting it on. If you wanna know what it is, look down in the description box because everything is linked. Around noon on October 31st, Halloween. 1975. 15-year-old Sheila McGuire left her house in Bellhaven, Connecticut to join the search party for her missing friend, 15-year-old Martha Moxley. So Bellhaven is an exclusive gated community inside Greenwich, Connecticut. It's full of super elite, extremely wealthy families. <laughs> this neighborhood has its own private beach, you know, private boating facilities, its own separate country club. You get it. And in 1975, the population of Greenwich was approximately 50,000, and the population of this particular neighborhood was like 200. So Greenwich is about an hour north of New York City and only about 30 minutes south of Stamford, Connecticut. So it's sort of like a hub for professionals that work in both cities. So Sheila had seen Martha the night before, but she'd heard from Martha's mother that she hadn't come home. So this was very out of character for Martha. She wasn't a troublemaker. She she wasn't wild, you know. Sheila was worried, so she made the rounds of all the teen spots, you know, places that they would hang out, and uh, she didn't find anything. But as she crossed over the back half of the Moxley's yard, she saw something strange under a tree. We all know what it is. We know what it is, you guys. Sheila wasn't sure what it was, you know, it was like a lumpy pile of something. And as she got closer, she realized she had found Martha, but she wasn't alive anymore. So Martha had beautiful tan skin and blonde hair, but she was unrecognizable. You know, she had so much blood in her hair that it looked red and it was hard to even tell if it was her. Sheila later said that it was mainly Martha's clothing that helped her identify her at first. You know, she was lying face down, wearing a navy blue down like puffer coat. Her corduroy pants and underwear had been pulled down, you know, bunched around her ankles. Her shoes were still on. She was lying in a large puddle of blood. It was obvious that she had been dragged there from the front yard. Parts of a golf club were sticking out of her neck. Sheila was obviously horrified. You know, who could have possibly done this? Everyone loved Martha. So who was she? I'm glad you asked. Martha Elizabeth Moxley was born on August 16th, 1960 in San Francisco, California to Dorothy and John David Moxley. She had an older brother, John, and they were being raised in Oakland. In 1974, so about a year before this terrible event, her father had taken a new job in New York City, so they moved to Bellhaven. John David was the managing partner of a very successful international accounting firm. Martha was described as fun and outgoing, the ultimate California girl. She was the new girl, but she made friends quickly with everyone in the neighborhood. She started her high school career her freshman year at Greenwich High School, and she was even voted most popular. According to her diary that was found and inspected after her death, 
She loved her new school and she was happy having moved to Connecticut. It was also revealed in the diary that she spent a lot of time hanging out with the two neighborhood boys, Tommy and Michael Skakel. So the weekend before she was murdered, she had come home after her curfew. And since she was late, her mom had grounded her. Well, the night of October 30th is known as Mischief Night. It's the night before Halloween and neighborhood kids run around causing mischief. <laughs> We're streaking! We're streaking! <laughs> throwing eggs at cars and houses, throwing toilet paper up in the trees, ringing doorbells and running away. It's pretty innocent, you know? And by the way, mischief night seems to be a pretty regional term um, or even just a regional activity. Doesn't seem like a lot of the United States participates in this, but whatever. Well, since it was mischief night, some of Martha's friends had come over and asked her mom to please let her come out, even though she was supposed to be grounded. Well, her mother, Dorothy, gave in because Martha was a good kid and she felt like she'd already learned her lesson. So Martha and her friends went out. They went to a few other friends' houses in the neighborhood and they ended up at the Skakel residence. So the Skakels were a pretty large family. Rushton and Ann Skakel, there's seven children, most of them teenagers by this time. Rushton Jr., Julia, Thomas, John, Michael, David, and Stephen Skakel. They lived on the same street as the Moxleys. The house was across and up to, so diagonal. Anne had actually died of cancer two years earlier, and Rush was the heir to a coal fortune. He served as the chairman of the board at the company that his grandfather founded, Great Lakes Carbon Corporation. And this was generational wealth. Rush wasn't some... A uh, workaholic businessman. You know, they were obscenely wealthy. Rush was kind of a heavy drinker and he just sort of like lived, you know, doing whatever he wanted, his own thing. Lots of hunting trips, lots of whatever. Not a lot of work. But he was sort of gone a lot. This left the children to their own devices, particularly after Anne passed away. The Skakel boys were wild. So the boys were especially known to everyone in the town to be wild, unruly, and well-connected. And what do I mean by well-connected? In addition to having more money than God, which is enough, Rush's brother-in-law was, you know, Bobby Kennedy. So <laughs> this family was like Kennedy level connected. So on that day, Mischief Night, October 30th, 1975, the Skakel family's new live-in tutor moved into the house. 23-year-old Kenneth Littleton. So the kids did go to private school locally, like most of the kids that lived in Belhaven, but Ken moved in to tutor Tommy and Michael, but he, he essentially was a nanny for all the kids. When Sheila last saw Martha that night, she said that Martha was sitting in a car with a couple of the Skakel boys at their house. Martha was sitting in the front seat of the car with 15-year-old Michael, just sitting there listening to music and talking. After a short time, 17-year-old Tommy came out and sat with them too with Martha in the middle. Tommy was being very flirtatious with Martha, tickling, poking, giggling, you know, that whole thing. Eventually, some other neighborhood kids showed up and joined them, sitting in the back seat. You know, they were just hanging out. At 9.30, two of the other Skagel boys came out and said that they needed to use the car. They wanted to go to their cousin's house, Jimmy Tyrion, to watch the broadcast debut of Monty Python's Flying Circus. So Michael decided to go with them. He asked Martha to join, but she said, no, thank you. I have a curfew, promised my mom I'd be home by 11, can't be late again. Well, Michael and the others left in the car, but Martha and Tommy stayed behind for a time. Tommy later told the police that he went inside pretty shortly after. They said goodnight, he went inside to do homework and watch TV. He was like writing some report about Abraham Lincoln. Whatever. When he finished up, he started watching TV with the tutor, Ken. Well, Martha's mom, Dorothy, kind of waited up for Martha to get home that night. She ended up falling asleep on the couch. When she woke up just before 2 a.m., she checked Martha's bed, found it undisturbed, unoccupied. So she started calling around trying to find her. She called the Skakel house and 18 year old Julie answered the phone and told her that she had last seen Martha with Tommy. With every call that she made, nobody had seen her, but she was sure that as soon as she hung up, Martha would come walking in the door. But the clock kept ticking and Martha didn't come home. So eventually she called the police. The police did come out to the Moxley house and they did a very cursory search. They found nothing and they left. Well, when the Moxleys and the other friends started looking 
around the neighborhood. Dorothy Moxley actually went to the Skakel's house to see if they had seen her or if maybe she was there. She said that she clearly remembers speaking to Michael who appeared hungover or maybe even still intoxicated barefoot, disheveled, you know. He told her he hadn't seen Martha since they'd said goodnight. And I know what you're thinking, yes, Martha's body at this point is definitely in the backyard under this tree. But the full search really wasn't complete until daylight. Okay, so now we are back where we started and Sheila has discovered Martha Moxley's badly beaten body. Investigators also found what was determined to be the murder weapon, a golf club. Martha had been bludgeoned about the head and stabbed in the neck. The autopsy report shows that strands of Martha's hair had been pushed all the way through her neck to the other side. She had also been struck so hard with that golf club that it broke into four pieces. They determined that the point of attack was Martha's front yard because they found blood there and the head of the golf club. It was a lady's Tony Penna six iron. So Martha had been dragged through the yard and the grass was kind of long so you could see the the imprint into the backyard where it was a little bit more wooded. Two pieces of the golf club's shaft were found in the yard with blood on them. You know, the head of the club was near the driveway. One piece was stuck in Martha's neck in the grip, like the handle, totally missing. And that is quite interesting because that is likely where the fingerprints would have been found. So most of the articles on this case claim that there were no indications of sexual assault, but later court documents reference the 1975 autopsy and coroner's report, and it says that the presence of semen was detected in the swimsuit area. There was also a reddish mark found at the top of her inner thighs consistent with like bloody hands trying to push legs apart. The actual trauma was confined to her head and there was even an imprint from the head of the golf club on her cheek. The cause of death was blunt force trauma, manner of death, homicide. So during the investigation, the police interviewed all of the residents of Bellhaven. Friends and neighbors told them that Michael and Tommy Skakel were rivals. Michael also had a drinking problem and a quick temper. Michael and Tommy were also both romantically interested in Martha. When the police arrived at the Skakel's home, Rush fully cooperated, you know, allowing them to look around and to speak to all of the children. They pretty quickly found a set of ladies' golf clubs, you know, Tony Penna golf clubs, and some were missing, including the six iron. Bingo bango, right? Pfft, murder weapon. Found. Well, get this. It was explained away that the Skakels were just, you know, big golfers. Rush kept clubs at each door, like in the little umbrella stand, and he would carry one on his daily walk in case he encountered some overly excited dog. Michael was also often seen carrying a golf club, but anyway, they would play chip and putt in their yard and they were known for just sort of leaving equipment scattered about the property. So anybody could have just picked that thing up. Sure, Jan. The point is that even though the murder weapon was obviously from the Skakel's home, a search warrant was never issued. They never searched the rest of the house for anything. So, the investigation. <laughs> Remember, Bellhaven was a very safe community, gated. Anybody that came through had to go through a guard by an actual person. There was no strangers there. So the idea that some random person just like showed up is laughable. Anyway, homicide wasn't something that the local police were prepared for, and this case was the first homicide that most of these investigators had ever worked on, and unfortunately it showed. One example, Dorothy Moxley told the police that she heard neighbor dogs barking like crazy between 9.30 and 10. And because of this, and only this, the investigators determined that that must have been the time of death. Now that is an extremely narrow window, especially considering that the medical examiners said that the time of death could have been between 9.30 p.m. and 5 a.m. But since the police essentially narrowed the window to like this much, they just believed Michael's alibi without squinting too much. So Michael's alibi, right? So he told the investigators during questioning that he had been with his brothers at his cousin's house watching TV at 9.30 and then he got home around 11.30 and went straight to bed. The cousins all corroborated this alibi. I mean, why wouldn't they? Tommy was the last known person to be seen with Martha. But remember, after everybody left to go to the cousin's house, he said that he went inside to do homework and watch TV with the tutor. Well, Ken, the tutor, totally corroborated the 
this story. You know, he mentioned a very specific scene that he remembers them being together watching and that would have aired around 10 p.m. Obviously, the movie that they were watching was airing on network TV so they could prove it. Well, Tommy also went to the police station for questioning. He was very cooperative. He took two polygraph tests. The first one was inconclusive, but the second one he passed. Rush Skakel wasn't really uh, comfortable with how close the police were looking at his kids. So after that, he fired Ken Littleton and then he hired an army of lawyers and stopped cooperating with the police. By the way, the police also squinted really hard at Ken Littleton. You know, he was new in town and for many years, Ken would be tossed around as sort of a prime suspect, I guess. It really kind of ruined his life for a time, but there was never any direct evidence to connect him to the case. He'd never even met Martha Moxley. Well, many people say that the Skakels used their power and influence to skirt the investigation. There were some witness accounts of Michael Skakel making comments on a few occasions that amount to him essentially bragging about getting away with murder. There was also another occasion when Michael threatened to jump off of the Triborough Bridge, saying that he'd done something very bad. Well, despite all that, the investigation just totally stalled. A couple years later, 1978, Michael Skakel was arrested for driving while intoxicated and failure to comply with officer commands. To avoid criminal charges, Rush sent him away to the Elan School in Portland, Maine for, you know, rehab. So Elan was a private residential behavioral modification treatment center. Wikipedia describes it as a part of the troubled teen industry. We really ought to do a video about that. Anyway, after Michael went away to that boarding school, he never returned to Greenwich or to Belhaven again. And the Moxleys first moved away to Annapolis and then later to New Jersey. Dorothy just couldn't bring herself to even look at the Skakel's house. After that, the case went ice cold. But frustrated with the media rumors that just wouldn't seem to die, you know, linking the Skakels to this case, Rush Skakel hired a consulting firm, Sutton Associates, to analyze the case and assess his son's risk of prosecution. So Sutton Associates provides private investigators, retired FBI agents, profilers, bodyguards, you know, pretty much full service for a very high price. They had full access to the Skakel family, particularly Michael and Tommy, for like three years. And the level of access that they had was way more than the police ever had. And to be clear, above all, Sutton provides complete discretion. At the end of it, they produced a report that was really meant for Rush's eyes only. Well, the report revealed that Michael and Tommy lied to the police in their initial interviews. This is what do we call self-snitching. Their alibis just kept changing, essentially. Michael said that his story about going to bed at 11.30 after getting back from the cousin's house, you know, was something that he made up to avoid being a suspect. That's suspicious. He said that he'd actually snuck out of the house around midnight and he climbed a tree that was outside of what he thought was Martha's bedroom and he, you know, rubbed one out. Watch your profanity. Tommy Skakel said that after everybody left to go to the cousin's house, he and Martha did some heavy making out, like hands in the pants stuff, for like a half an hour. Well, Rush Skakel ordered that report to be buried. Nothing to see here. And the team that had worked on it, everybody had signed NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, which is, you know, standard in this kind of work. All except for one person. Apparently, the person that they had hired to put the whole thing together, compile all of the information, they forgot to have him sign the NDA. Whoopsie. Well, after reading all the information in this report, the guy was so horrified and he was scared that it was just going to disappear. So this person made a copy of the Sutton report and leaked it to the press in 1985. So both Tommy and Michael's stories weren't doing them any favors as far as being suspects, but the police were really only interested in Michael. A witness from Elon's school had actually come forward saying that Michael confessed. He said that, quote, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. Dude, that's your uncle by marriage, okay? That's not how that works. 
That's not how any of this works. Well, fast forward to 1991. Famed crew crime writer Dominic Dunn became interested in the Moxley case and he started chasing down the details. He actually met with Dorothy Moxley and told her that he would like to write a novel to try to get some attention brought back to Martha's case. She was hesitant at first, but then when he explained that he personally understood her pain being the parent of a murdered daughter himself, then she agreed. The novel A Season in Purgatory became a bestseller in 1993. It was a fictionalized account of the Moxley murder case, but like names, locations, and other details had been changed. The undercurrent was the same. Well, that book and the Sutton Report and these witnesses coming forward talking about this weird behavior from Michael kept the case in the news. By the way, a copy of that Sutton Report had made its way to Dominic Dunn in 1994. Dominic said that he thought the report could be used to help solve the case, so he got it to a person that he thought would have the courage to stand up to the bourgeoisie in Greenwich, Connecticut. Somebody that wouldn't be afraid of the Skagels or the Kennedys or, you know, anyone. He gave it to Mark Furman. Ugh. I mean, just when we think this is gonna go someplace good, Mark Furman? <laughs> Mark Furman is a guy who, who just gets attention. There's no two ways about him. Like him, dislike him, it doesn't matter. You notice him. So Mark Furman is, to be polite, problematic. You'll remember him from the O.J. Simpson murder case, and I'm not gonna get into it, okay? Don't worry. Well, Mark Furman read the report, and then he met with Dorothy Moxley in 1998, promising her that he would be the one to find her daughter's killer. Mark teamed up with former Greenwich police officer Stephen Carroll, who worked on the Moxley case. And together they combed through the evidence and the reports and followed all of the leads. And to be clear, he found exactly no new evidence. I mean, this investigation was well underway without the help of Mark Furman, though he definitely wrote a book about it. <laughs> What he really did was keep the spotlight on the case. And the book straight up accused Michael of killing Martha in a jealous rage after finding out that Martha had hooked up with his brother Tommy. And he said that the Skakel family used their power and influence to cover it up. Anyway, so on June 18th, 1998, a grand jury was convened to investigate. After 18 months, Michael Skakel was indicted. On January 19th, 2000, the now 39-year-old Michael Skakel surrendered to police after an arrest warrant was issued. He was initially charged as a juvenile since the crime occurred when he was 15 years old. He was booked and then released on $500,000 bail while awaiting trial. In February 2001, the court ruled that Michael would be charged as an adult. So Michael's trial began in Bridgeport Superior Court in May of 2002, and the state outlined essentially everything that was in Mark's book. They brought in witnesses to testify to Michael's confessions and his erratic behavior. And on June 7, 2002, after four days of deliberation, the jury convicted Michael Skakel of the murder of Martha Moxley. That was a lot of M's all of a sudden. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. After years of appeals and picking apart every little detail that they could, jury selection, ineffective counsel, evidence, testimony, blah, blah, blah. Judge Thomas Bishop vacated Michael's conviction on October 13th, 2013 and ordered a new trial. Michael posted 1.2 million doll hairs bail and was released from prison in November of 2013. But hold on to your butts because in 2016, the prosecution somehow convinced the Connecticut Supreme Court to throw down the reverse card and they reinstated the original conviction. <laughs> Split 4-3 on the issue, reinstating Skakel's conviction, writing Skakel's defense attorney did provide constitutionally adequate representation. And then in 2018, reverse. another reverse card. The conviction was again vacated. Reverse the reverse. You guys dizzy yet? On October 30th of 2020, 45 years to the date of Martha Moxley's murder, the court announced that the charges against Michael Skakel were dismissed. No new trial would be ordered. The most recent movement in this case uh, was reported just the other day um, from the date that I'm filming this, January 6th. Ooh, January 6th. 
Michael Skagel has filed multiple lawsuits. He's suing the lead investigator from the case, and he's suing the town of Greenwich for malicious prosecution, violation of constitutional rights, and other things. So we will have to circle back to see how that shakes out. Did Michael Skagel murder Martha Moxley? Did Tommy do it? Well, they both had an interest in her, they had the opportunity, and they both had access to the murder weapon. So let me know what you think in the comments. And that is the story of Martha Moxley. <coughs> Ooh, that was a long one. That was a long one. Okay, if you want to see any of the makeup that I used in today's Luke, just Luke down in the description box. I link everything that's still available. And if it's not, I will find you something similar. If you have a crew crime story that you want to recommend to me, make sure that you look down in the description box for the link to the Google Doc. So you just go to it, fill in the details, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all of the other socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! <laughs> <clears throat> Motherfucker. You're at... Badly bought... You know... Ended up... Motherfucker. What am I doing? What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. And on June 7th to... I can't get it together. Some other neighborhood could... <sighs> I don't typically have issue... <sighs>